You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Ivan, go ahead and get us started. Hi, I'm Ivan Zak, and I'm excited to introduce Yanina Krumbeck. She's the director of My Dog Animal Diagnostics LLC, Tustin, California, and is leading the effort to bring novel diagnostic tools to veterinarians to improve the diagnosis of infectious diseases in animals. She earned her PhD from University of Nebraska-Lincoln in cell and molecular biology with an emphasis on microbial gastrointestinal ecology. Her mission is to apply her expertise in microbiome research, infectious disease diagnostics, and antibiotic stewardship to address unmet clinical needs and improve patient outcomes for both humans and animals. Yanina, welcome to the show. Thank you for finding the time. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Okay, well, a little piece of your a story that we know that you're from Germany. So how did you end up on this side of the pond? And uh, how did you end up in this field of veterinary medicine? Well, initially it was just supposed to be for six months for a little internship in Lincoln, Nebraska. But, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. I was uh, working on a master's project and, you know, sometimes it just clicks. I, the professor had very interesting topics for me to work on and ask if I wanted to come back for a PhD. And so, so at this point, six months turned into almost 12 years. After I finished my PhD in Nebraska, I found a great job in Orange County, California, and um, was able to work first in biotech industry, developing more tools on how to analyze the microbiome and how we can advance medical diagnostics. And then we ended up starting MyDoc in 2019. We officially launched at the Western Vet Conference. And yeah, since then, we've been pushing infectious disease diagnostics uh, into the 21st century. Very interesting. And before I asked what the hell is microbiome, I want to know what is the best part of Nebraska? For someone who never been there, tell us what Nebraska <laughs> is known for you loved it for. <laughs> well, I had a really good time. It's a wonderful place to be in grad school. And, you know, it was very charming. And it's a great place to be in grad school because cost of housing is relatively cheap. So you can actually afford a living while being in school. And Wonderful. What's the best food in Nebraska? That's the last question I swear about Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Omaha steaks, I guess. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for those. Uh, can, can you please explain us? What is the microbiome and what are you working on? Yeah, so the microbiome is a conjuncture of living organisms in a given habitat. So it would include, in this case, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. And we are all colonized by these different microorganisms when we are born. We are born the sterile, but then as soon as we are passing the birth canal, we are being colonized by mom's microbiome. And though all those different organisms influence our health as we grow up. They are part of... Um, the maturation of our immune system, they help us to digest our food, they help us fight off infections. And the microbiome can be very complex and it's very unique to each and every one of us and it's unique to the body area that you're sampling. So for example, the composition of those bacteria, fungi and viruses on your skin would be quite different than it would be in your gastrointestinal tract. So I guess the question I have is, you know, we got the background, we, we understand now how you got uh, lost in the United States and six months turned into 12 years. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the, I guess, the origin story for the company. How did you kind of get going down this road? And then why is what you're doing inside veterinary medicine so unique, so novel, so innovative, as you said, that you're trying to pull us into the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so Right after my PhD, I was working as a postdoc and we were looking at different ways to analyze the microbiome. The tool is called next generation DNA sequencing, which has been around since 2005. And it's been used by scientists all across the world, but there are some challenges on how to accurately diagnose the microbiome in order to really capture all the organisms that are there, not just those that are easy to analyze. And yeah, that kind of work that I was doing at the time was very theoretical optimizing workflows, so it can get a little bit dry. And so if you want to present that kind of work to other scientists, it's nice to give them a story to have real world samples you're working with. And at that time, my colleague Mark, his dog was having a severe infection on one of his front paws. And so we thought, why don't we sample his paws 
then we do the microbiome analysis. It gives us real world data that we can talk about with our friends and colleagues at conferences and see how, what tools did we use to analyze this data. Once we looked at the results from his left and his right paw, they were drastically different in the composition of both the bacteria and the fungi that we found there. And his dog, Boo Boo was his name, or is actually, um, he was suffering from that infection for a long time. And we found that there were Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Malassezia. And then my colleague Mark said, well, this result is drastically different than what I got from my veterinary clinic. They also send it for testing, for culture-based testing, and they came back with just a Streptococcus. But now we see there's so much more here. So we took a very first, very rudimentary report to Mark's veterinarian and said, well, we got all this data. It seems like there's much more going on in Boo Boo's paw than the previous diagnostic tools had said. And his veterinarian, he loved it. Uh, his name is Dr. Kevin. He's now on our advisory board. He just thought, oh my goodness, this is so unique. I've never seen anything like this. I have been trying to treat Buddy for years and we've been sending all these samples out. I've never gotten these type of results back. And based on our results, he was able to resolve the infection within two weeks. And so we started looking, is anyone else offering this type of diagnostics? And no, nobody was. And so we had an idea that there, there could be a market for it. There is definitely a need for it because millions of animals are suffering every year from infection, a lot of them being chronic, a lot of them being caused by multifactorial organisms. It's often more than just a bacterium, it can be a fungi, it can be a virus, but there was no other company offering this type of testing. And so we thought, let's give it a try. That's such a cool story. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think you're lucky that you got onto this vet that really loved it. I. I can uh, name probably a handful of my colleagues that would hate that. They'd be like, what are you telling me? Did you Google that again? And so, you know, people are usually veterinarians looking at owners that they have no clue and they're Googling everything. And someone with your background coming in, that would be intimidating. So I'm glad that it worked out for that relationship. Um, so can you unpack that a little bit more for us in a clinical application, what you're trying to Create. What is this going to look like for a veterinarian on the ground who is basically working? What is what is the product, and how would I use it if I'm a, if I'm a vet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, my dog animal diagnostics is at this point an independent veterinary diagnostic lab, and we specialize in this type of next generation DNA sequencing and microbiome analysis to diagnose infectious diseases in all animals and sample types. It has the advantage that it's molecular based. So in a nutshell it could replace culture and PCR testing. When it comes to infectious diseases, the gold standard is still culture-based diagnostics. This tool has been around from the 1880s. It's relying on collecting a sample, shipping it off to a laboratory and growing it in these little Petri dishes. And if Louis Pasteur or Robert Koch, if they were alive today and would walk into a microbiology laboratory still doing culture testing, not that much would have changed for them. We have improved the media, we have improved the type of incubation chambers that we have, but the principle remains the same. And based on DNA and RNA evidence at this point, we know that there's 10 to the 20 microbes on this planet Earth. And we know that only one to 3% of those microbes are actually culturable. So when you send a sample out for culture testing, you're often limited to those organisms that are fast growing, those that are aerobic, that actually survived the transit into the laboratory and that we know how to grow. But you're missing a lot of different pathogens that are out there. And by using molecular based tools, you're not limiting yourself in any way. You can untargetedly look for any kind of pathogens in those sample, even if they are novel, extremely rare or impossible to culture. And with a fast turnaround time of two to four days, you can confidently treat all infection in those animals because you know exactly what's causing the infection and how to most efficiently treat them instead of just waiting for culture to grow one or two organisms. So <clears throat> you mentioned two to four days. Is there also growth mm -hmm. um, required for these bacteria or, or is it molecular testing that takes a couple of days? It is all molecular based. So we would preserve the sample via a DNA preservation agent. So no refrigeration is needed. It's being shipped to us overnight. And then we start on the DNA extraction. The DNA extraction is all being done on 
robots at this point. We beat beat the samples to break open all of the cells so we can ensure we get the DNA from all the different microbes that are present, no matter how tough their cell wall is or how tiny they might be. And then we use Illumina sequencing to identify all bacteria and fungi in there. That takes about 20 hours just for the sequencing. So we are able to turn around results in about 48 hours. And then once we identify all the organisms that are present, we would sort them into commensals versus pathogens. Because just as an example, if we would swap the skin of a clinically healthy dog, just a square centimeter, we would find about 250 to 300 different types of bacteria species, 10 to the four, 10 to the five different bacteria. But a lot of them are commensals. And of course, for diagnostic purposes, you are interested in the pathogens. So once we have all those millions of DNA reads back, we sort them based on commensal versus pathogen. And for the pathogens, we also test for antimicrobial resistances. We have 43 different antibiotics that we routinely test for, and those sensitivity panels are included in the report in 48 hours as well. So no, we are not growing anything. It's all molecular based. It's so fascinating. So I guess, you know, our audience is mostly veterinarians and people in the industry. So let's talk about really practical use cases and like maybe some of the highlights of what you've been able to do for the veterinarians that have engaged with you and used your testing so far. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the samples that stand out first are those chronic infections, those animals that have been suffering for a long time. So one of those examples would be Daisy, who is a dachshund that had been suffering from on and off UTI for about two and a half years. And her veterinarian had been sending the samples for UTI culture growth multiple times. It usually came back no growth, or if anything, it was E. coli. So all he could do is treat empirically and target the pathogens that were reported by culture. But when we were finally able to get a sample from Daisy, we found that there was urea plasma and mycoplasma in there as well. Organisms that would require very different types of antibiotics. And so once her veterinarian started treating for those infections, he was actually able to resolve it. We're still following Daisy to this day, and she had never had a recurring UTI again. And it highlights how, how much culture is missing, especially for urinary tract infections. Even the AVMA in 2020 published a study in which they reported that 67% of all urinary tract infection samples come back no growth, even if they're incubated the day of at the same location without any refrigeration, without waiting for pickup, best case scenario. And urine is not sterile, so nothing should ever come back, no growth. But even at 67%, no growth detected. That just highlights how many organisms we are missing, how many of them are clinically relevant for infectious disease diagnostics if we rely on culture testing. Another super interesting case was with Dr. Rosenkranz. Uh, he was seeing a golden retriever named Cooper who had a T tissue pyoderma. And again, it was not resolving. He's a dermatology specialist, so Cooper was referred over to him. And we took a sample from Cooper at the same time culture and NGS testing. And culture testing came back with a Pseudomonas infection. Undefined Pseudomonas, just a species within that genus, versus our test came back with a bull cold urea. And that was the first time this kind of pathogen was reported in a dog with deep tissue pyoderma. There's very few cases in human diagnostics that have this pathogen present but never in dogs. And so DNA doesn't lie. It's the molecular tool that helps us identify specifically what pathogen it is. It doesn't rely on gram standing or it's rod shaped and morphologically markers like that. It's molecular based. It helps us to specifically identify which organism it is and not just based on what it looks like or how it behaves. And I'm, I'm risking here to dig myself deeper into something I don't understand. Please, but... please do. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> How do you differentiate between the commensal microflora and pathogens? Like, how do you separate the two? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, luckily, there are lots of veterinary books written. So we do have a defined list on path of pathogens based on the literature. Worldwide, people are always working on new case reports. So we update our pathogen database regularly. And commensals, some of them are already known. Others, we are continuing to discover. And... Defining a commensal versus a pathogen actually can be quite challenging. The original definition by Robert Koch was you have an infected individual, you isolate the pathogen, you infect a healthy individual with that pathogen, they develop the same disease. But a lot of these organisms are unculturable. 
we can only know that they're there based on their DNA. We know their metabolites, we know how they behave, but we cannot isolate them. So in these cases, we use machine learning tools and AI to have, once we have large sample data sets with all the same markers of disease and the same phenotypes that we can then at one point confidently say, this is indeed a pathogen, even though we're not able to isolate it. And on the other hand, another approach that we take is swap hundreds and hundreds of healthy individuals. So we went out and swapped dogs for their nose, their, their oral microbiome, their ears, their feces to establish what is a clinically healthy microbiome. And those were all samples taken by veterinarians. So to the best of their knowledge, these individuals were healthy. They were not taking any antibiotics for a certain period of time. They were not taking any probiotics or other medication. So we can establish what organisms would we expect to see and in which numbers. So for example, when we swap clinically healthy dog skin, we would see Pseudomonas aeruginosa in almost all the individuals. 90 to 95 percent of the dogs would have this known pathogen on their skin but in very low numbers maybe a few hundred organisms maybe one or two percent of the overall microbiome so it shows us that even though we identify pathogen in a sample it doesn't always warrant a treatment it always depends on what are the levels of the pathogens how are they interacting with the rest of the microbiome are they present in one or two percent or are they suddenly representing 80 or 90 percent of the microbiome and then based on those markers, we can look at every single pathogen and every single commensals that we find in a sample. And that's hundreds, if not thousands. And we can establish healthy range. So when you send in a sample from a dog, we would find 250 bacteria. We would sort out, okay, these are five pathogens. The rest are commensals. Of these five pathogens, one or two are outside the normal range. They are high. So we draw the veterinarian's attention to those. The other three might be within the normal range. So we still tell you, hey, there's a coronabacterium, there is a pseudomonas, but it's within the normal range. But the Staphylococcus on the other side and the Malassezia, they are way outside the normal range. These are what we would recommend focus your attention to. And building these databases has been one of our biggest missions that we pursue because we want to build a clinically healthy reference database for every single animal that we encounter. So we have them for dogs and cats. We're actively working with a lot of exotic veterinarians to establish what is a healthy fecal microbiome of a ferret, of a bunny, or even a pilot whale. Wow, so fascinating. So let's double click on the use cases a little bit, Yanina. So what I'm hearing is your product and your testing is really, really great for veterinarians that might be out there with a, a chronic case that just won't go away, that they're stuck on. But what about everyday veterinary medicine? How do you fit in there? And let's just talk a little bit more to the audience, which is a bunch of veterinarians that might have a use case. And then let's tack on it if they'd like to start, if they'd like to use your services, your testing, what does that look like? How do they get started? Mm -hmm. So we have lots of veterinarians that at this point have replaced their routine culture testing with our diagnostic tool. So it's not just for the extreme chronic cases, but for everyday cases coming in. The test is so sensitive that it can be applied even to an individual as they are already taking antibiotics. You can specifically see, is the antibiotic targeting the pathogen that I'm interested in, or maybe other secondary pathogens? Is the antibiotic wiping out the commensals? And after the antibiotic treatment, you can see, did we restore a healthy microbiome? Do we get the diversity back? Maybe we would like to add on a probiotic or prebiotic or symbiotic or postbiotic to improve the regular health of that individual. A subpar of our clients were the ones that started with the chronic diseases where it was the last resort the last resort of help to fight these infections. They started seeing, oh, this tool helps me for all my other cases as well. And so we routinely see dogs, cats, and a lot of exotics at this point. Good. And to get started is super easy. No long-term contracts, no minimum orders. You, you simply order your collection kit and that's it. And where do you find you just so people uh, know where to go and how to learn more about it? The easiest way to get more information and to get started would be by going to our website, www.mydogtest.com.
Excellent. And I was just about to ask, is there a particular reason for discrimination on cats? Because it's called my dog. But you, didn't <laughs> <laughs> but you did mention that it's a cat's welcome as well. <laughs> yes, any kind of animal species, really. If there's one thing that I would change in our history, it is the name. Because it is slightly misleading. We see so much more than just dogs. Uh, while dogs are the animal type that we started our services with, we do have the largest database of a healthy microbiome and commensals for dogs. Um, the exotic market is actually our fastest growing sectors because those veterinarians often rely on PCR testing, limiting themselves to a panel of just maybe four to eight targets. And why limit yourself when you can get untargeted sequencing, identifying all pathogens, no matter how rare or novel they are. And since we quantify the cell counts too, it's not just detected, not detected, you, you get the full picture. And it, it's really a no brainer to switch from a PCR or quantitative PCR testing to NGS based diagnostics. And I just wanted to spell my dog because it's M-I, not M-Y, right? <laughs> Correct. Just for, just for our auditory audience. I, I, yeah, ahead. microbial diagnostics. Yeah. Oh, that's where the <laughs> M-I, okay, that makes sense. I was just remembering the early days of my vet girl uh, and her startup, Justin Lee, and uh, I was telling her that she's discriminating against male veterinarians. So, but that's relevant because there is mostly uh, female veterinarians out there these days. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. This is fascinating. This is very interesting, and I would love to uh, get my hands on it. I don't think that in our cold uh, Canada it's available, or is it? Is it just uh, California, or is it everywhere? Where, where is it now? It is available. Yeah, we have a Canadian distributor, BioVet, and we are available almost worldwide because of our DNA preservation reagent. It doesn't matter if the samples are coming from Australia or from San Diego, California. We are available worldwide and every single state of the U.S. Well, then we're going to air this episode. Last time someone said they're not available in Canada, we said we're not going to air it. Just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, thank you so much. We always ask two questions at the end. The first question, is there a book, TED Talk, YouTube video, or any other source of information that you were uh, interested in and you heard, listened, or read that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, a book I would recommend would be Think Again by Adam Grant. It was a couple of years ago that I heard the audiobook, but it stick with me because it highlights how we can be stuck in our way of thinking and that it's important to sometimes take a step back, reconsider how have we been doing things? Why have I been doing things this way? Is this really the correct way moving forward? And of course, it's very applicable to my dog again, uh, as well, because we are asking to rethink infectious disease diagnostics, moving away from the gold standard that has been around since the 1880s, and to think again, bringing infectious disease diagnostics into the 21st century. And so that's um, why I would recommend this book. Well, that was a very eloquent recommendation. Thank you for that. Uh, last question is, do you have another innovator in your network that you think we should have on this podcast? That was a tough one. Um, I work with so many interesting collaborators, so I'm very fortunate to be doing so much research with leading veterinarians in the field. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would go with Dr. Tonatio Melgarejo from Western University. He's an innovator in the way he thinks about infectious disease testing. He's an expert in antimicrobial resistances and animal nutrition. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.